Welcome to the session on topics in current research in blockchain. Uh, I'm Sriram Kannan. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Washington, Seattle. We'll begin our session with our first talk by uh, Ari Jules, who is the Vale Family Foundation and Joan and Sanford Vale Professor at Cornell Tech. It's a pleasure to have you here, Ari. Yeah, thank you. In 2014, Michael Lewis published a best-selling book entitled Flash Boys. It was an expose on the Wall Street practice of high-frequency trading. Now, the term high-frequency trading is essentially a kind of catch-all term. But the different definitions of high-frequency trading have a few common characteristics. The first is that high-frequency trading involves the use of bots or algorithms rather than human traders. This is beneficial in that Bots can make use of sophisticated algorithms, and they're also fast, which relates to the second common characteristic, namely that high-frequency trading, as its name suggests, involves a quest for speed. And a large amount of investment in systems required to achieve low latencies, to say fast trades. The third characteristic of high-frequency trading is an exploitation of speed to gain an advantage over other traders. This is often referred to as latency arbitrage. I'm going to use the term front running. Wall Streeters would object to my particular use of it. But you'll see why I employ that term in this talk. Well, Lewis's book created a sensation and provoked a flurry of investigation by the SEC, the FBI, and so on and so forth, fines and regulatory changes. The pros and cons of high frequency trading still are much debated. And I'm not an expert on HFT, so I can't present these pros and cons. But suffice it to say that the conclusion of Lewis's book was his famous declaration that the market is rigged. With blockchains, of course, everything is supposed to be different. You'll recall that Bitcoin was developed in 2008, 2009, in the midst of the financial meltdown, the financial crisis, caused by this very straight, same Wall Street. Bitcoin, of course, is a peer-to-peer -peer system and a transparent one. And consequently, was supposed to create a level playing field. And blockchains, similarly, are supposed to avoid many of the pitfalls that Wall Street has brought to trading and the shenanigans that Wall Street traders use to, as Lewis would argue, cheat ordinary traders and ordinary consumers. This characteristic of blockchains, their transparency, the fact that in principle they should enforce fairness, has led the famous Tapscott uh, father and son duo, for instance, pundits in our area, to declare that blockchains can help build integrity into all of our institutions and create a more secure and trustworthy world, if only. As we'll see, we're very far from realizing this dream. To see this, let's consider one of the things that blockchains are used for today. They're used to solve the problem of fair exchanges, as often called. Let's suppose that Alice has some asset, like Ether, and Bob has created a new token called Bob's Bubble Token, and they'd both like to trade. Alice would like to exchange her one Ether for Bob's Bubble Token. Well, Bob, being polite as he is, might say to Alice, please, you go first. You send me your ether, and I'll happily send my bubble token. Well, if they've never met and they don't trust one another, then this is going to be a problem for Alice. And similarly, it will be a problem if Bob is the first mover. The first mover is always at a disadvantage because there's no guarantee that the other player will reciprocate. How do they solve this problem? One way to solve this is to appeal to a trusted third party in the form of an exchange. An exchange will take into custody the assets of the two players, take Alice's Ether and Bob's bubble token, and if all goes well, it will affect a fair exchange. In other words, it will perform an atomic swap of the bubble tokens and the Ether. Alice will get her bubble token, Bob will get his Ether. Well, this is what happens if all goes as planned. But there are other possibilities. The exchange 
could, of course, since it holds these assets, simply make off with them. Or the exchange could be hacked, and the assets could be lost in some other way. This is a problem with all centralized exchanges. You have no guarantee that you'll get your assets back or get the assets that you traded for. Unless the exchange is honest and well run, there's always the risk of loss. How do we solve this problem? Well, we're talking about cryptocurrency, of course. So the natural solution is to throw a blockchain at the problem. We can do this by replacing this centralized exchange with a smart contract. And this is the idea behind what's known as a decentralized exchange. A decentralized exchange, in a nutshell, is an exchange in which assets are held in custody in a smart contract rather than by some trusted third party. Now, there are several different decentralized exchange designs. I'm going to focus on the one that we've explored in our research. In this design, the smart contract, as I said, will take into custody the assets of the two parties, counterparties trading with one another. So the smart contract will take custody of, As of Alice's ether and of Bob's bubble token. And the exchange operator in this case will take responsibility not for custodying assets, but for maintaining some kind of order book. The order book is off-chain, typically. So Alice, if she's looking to buy some bubble token, can place an order in this book. And Bob, or anyone else interested in trading with Alice, who observes the order, can then do what's known as taking the order, can trade against the order. The way this works is that Bob countersigns the order, applies a digital signature associated with his account, sends the countersigned order to the smart contract, and the smart contract, which holds the assets, will then swap them. So now Alice gets the bubble token, and Bob gets the ether. Well, as you can see, de decentralized exchanges solve the problem that I described. And in general, decentralized exchanges seem great. Right? They seem to accomplish all the things that you would want to with a blockchain. In particular, assets now can't be stolen by the exchange operator. The operator of the order book, the operator of the exchange, doesn't hold Alice or Bob's assets. Additionally, this system is accessible to anyone. Anyone can send a transaction to the smart contract. Now, the exchange operator can censor the order book, can prevent your accessing the order book, but can't prevent your trading with respect to the smart contract. The system is transparent. Every trade that takes place on this exchange is visible on chain, because trades are executed as transactions against the smart contract. In Ethereum, they're just Ethereum transactions. But is it fair? Well, suppose that Alice places an order in the order book, but she makes a typographical error. She intends to pay only one ether for Bob's bubble token, but she accident or anyone's bubble token, but she accidentally places an order in which she offers 10 ether for one bubble token. Well, this is obviously a juicy order. Anyone is going to leap at the chance to sell a bubble token for 10 ether when a bubble token is only worth one ether. So Bob would be, of course, inclined to take this order. But Alice may quickly realize she's made a mistake here and may endeavor to cancel her order. She can do this happily by sending a cancel transaction to the DEX contract, right, to the exchange. And at this point, if Bob attempts to take Alice's order, the DEX contract will refuse to process Bob's countersigned version of the order. That's he will not be able to take the order. Well, that's all well and good. But suppose that the critical B at the end of Bob's name is replaced with a T. Suppose instead of Bob, Alice is dealing with a bot. Well, a bot, of course, will quickly spot Alice's juicy order and want to take it, want to trade against it. As I said, Alice, who realizes that she's made a typo, may quickly submit a cancellation order. But a bot can act as fast as Alice, and, and faster, of course, and will observe not just Alice's juicy order, but her attempt to cancel it. Now, Alice, in 
replaces her cancellation order with a certain amount of what's known as gas, right? This is the parallel currency that fuels Ethereum. The bot can place a fresh order with a higher gas price. Miners in systems like Ethereum, essentially in any smart contract system that's gas powered or equivalent to gas powered, miners have an incentive to place first in blocks the orders with the highest gas price. Right? Because gas is paid to miners. So miners are obviously going to take the juiciest transaction in terms of gas payment that it sees. And therefore, it will place the bot's order first in the block, even if Alice has submitted her cancellation order to the network before the bot submitted the take order. The bot's order will come first. It will be processed first. It will cause the bot to receive Alice's ether. And now Alice's cancellation order will be invalid because the ether have already been sent to the bot. And this, of course, makes Alice very sad. The intuition here is that the bot is essentially bribing the miner, paying the miner extra, uh, well, higher gas price, I should say, rather than extra gas, higher gas price in order to have the privilege of front-running Alice, of getting ahead of her in line to have its transaction processed. Well, Alice may be sad, but she's not alone. This has happened to countless users. I don't know how many, hundreds certainly, possibly thousands. And many of these users have posted pleas in online forums asking bot masters to return their money. And some of these are, are really heart-wrenching. Right? You know, I'm a stay-at-home parent. I day trade to keep my family above order. I made a, placed a mistaken order. It was just seconds ago. Please return the money. I made a mistake. Please send it back. I have faith in you, man. Please, 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 this was an accident. I'm a single parent, lots of parents here, apparently supporting their children by day trading. <laughs> and I'm at a job I hate. Please have some mercy. Right? And this poor fellow was really desperate right? and issued repeated pleas. Please return not all the money, but some of the money. I'll be happy even if I get only some of the money back. I might need to sell my car to pay for the losses I've incurred in this trade. Uh, you know, just give me back one ether and I will be happy. And this was the most disturbing message we came across. Some poor fellow had gathered up all the rupee in his village and rolled the dice on one trade and a bot stepped in and took all the money. Right? And one shudders to think of what happened to this guy when he had to explain to the village that he lost all their money to a bot. There are many, many more of these. These are just a few examples. But use the words of Hobbes. In the world of decentralized exchange, exchanges at least, life is nasty, brutish, and short. As we've seen, typos are one source of arbitrage, and bots are out there cheating humans. And there are many other sources of arbitrage as well that I won't have time to talk about today. Bots also, as it turns out, not just don't just cheat users, but compete with one another, attempt to cheat one another, as follows. So suppose that Alice has, again, placed this erroneous order that a bot is interested in taking. The bot will essentially outbid Alice in terms of gas price. Right? Alice offered 20 gas for her cancellation order. The bot author offers 30 gas. Well, some second bot may also observe this juicy order and observe that this first bot attempted to front run Alice. What will the second bot do then? Well, naturally, the second bot will place a take order with an even higher gas price. Well, the first bot may observe that the second bot did this. So what does the first bot do? Well, of course, the first bot raises the gas price even higher. And they can go back and forth doing this for a very long time, essentially until a block is produced and one of these transactions gets mined. And one side note here, when you raise the gas price with respect to a transaction you've placed, you essentially erase the old transaction. It's forgotten by the network. We observe this kind of vicious competition between bots very frequently. Whenever a user places an order with a typo or otherwise makes a mistake, and there's some juicy order on the books, some bot is likely to find it, and it, in many cases, 
two or more bots find it and will compete with one another and bid up the gas price in exactly the manner I described. So you see that happening in this graph here. Now, I mentioned that when an order is placed, uh, rather a transaction is placed in Ethereum and the gas price is then raised by the user that placed the transaction, the old transaction's forgotten. So these competitions between and among bots are actually not visible on chain. Transparency has failed us in this sense. In order to observe these bidding wars among bots, we had to create our own instrumentation. And we spent thousands of dollars on AWS time gathering data about bot priority gas auctions, as we call them, this competition involving gas price raises. We've made the data we've collected available publicly on this website, frontrun.me. It's a little out of date at this point, but you'll see graphs of the type that I showed you earlier and some more sophisticated and complex ones. These may well be of interest to game theorists for reasons that I'll explain in just a moment. So these bots are engaging in, as I said, a kind of auction around, revolving around gas prices. What sort of strategies do they use to determine when and how much they're going to raise gas prices by? Well, these auctions are a very unusual and interesting game, as it turns out. To begin with, the bots have imperfect information. There's some latency involved in placing a transaction on the Ethereum network. It takes time for the transaction to propagate to miners and to other bots sitting on the network. So this is a game with imperfect information. It's a continuous time game. Right? This is not a synchronous system. So these bots are working in, as I said, continuous time. It also has another interesting characteristic that's sometimes referred to as all pay. This is a partial all pay auction. In most auctions, if you submit a losing bid, you pay nothing. But in these priority gas auctions, if you submit a losing bid, that's to say you're the bot on the losing end of the competition, you place a transaction that is processed second and therefore is invalid, you still have to pay the gas cost of your transaction. Bots have found ways to reduce the gas costs they pay, but they still pay something. So the loser is losing money in this type of auction. And that makes it somewhat unusual. And finally, these auctions are unusual in that they last for an amount of time that is determined probabilistically. The auction ends when a block is mined. And blocks are mined and in probabilistic intervals. So it's unlike a typical real world auction where the auction ends when the bidding stops or the auction ends at a predetermined time. In this case, the bidders, the bots, have no idea when the auction is going to end. Okay. Or they know the end time of the auction only statistically, probabilistically. Right. We've analyzed, we've modeled mathematically and analyzed these strange auctions and found that there is, in fact, an equilibrium involving something called a grim trigger strategy, where one bot will punish another bot if it deviates from the equilibrium strategy. I won't get into the details of the strategy, but I'll note that one characteristic of this equilibrium strategy is that bots raise their gas prices by the smallest possible increment permitted by the network. And we found, in fact, this doesn't always happen, but it has actually happened here, that the mathematical ma model matches reality. As we actually see convergence toward equilibrium in terms of the gas price raises that bots are executing. The smallest raise permitted by most Ethereum clients is 12.5%. And we see bots gravitating toward these low price rises in the priority gas auctions they're engaging in. So you can see, over time, the gas price raises have diminished until they have reached essentially 12.5%. Some of them are sitting at 15 for reasons we don't completely understand. But the reality, as I said, actually matches the mathematical model, which is very rare and satisfying. And as you'll also appreciate, these behaviors are very Wall Street-like. 
where there's money to be made, sophisticated strategies will develop. And this quest for speed that the Flash Boys book spotlighted is present also in this world of bots and decentralized exchanges. Now, Michael Lewis in, his, in Flash Boys actually begins the book with a, an account of how a company called Spread Networks invested hundreds of millions of dollars to create a fiber optic connection between Chicago and the servers in New Jersey um, that support Wall Street. Uh, uh, the exchange servers for Wall Street are, in many cases, located in New Jersey, just to shave a few milliseconds off the latency for Chicago to New York transactions. By the time Flash Boys was published, this expensive, super expensive fiber optic cable was already obsolete. High frequency traders had installed the microwave link. Light travels in a straight line, cables don't, so they were able to shave off another four milliseconds, I think it was. Well, as I said, we're seeing exactly this quest for speed in the priority auction gas game that bots are playing in Ethereum, as our model predicts. And here you can see, over time, a diminution in the mean time between bids. Bots are bidding faster and faster, and an increase that's the heat map component of the graph here, an increase in the number of raises taking place in a typical priority gas auction. Well, this is bad enough, but this turns out, this phenomenon of DEX arbitrage turns out to be just the tip of the tip of the tip of the iceberg. What I mean by this is that our best estimate, and it's really just a very conservative lower bound, suggests that the amount of DEX arbitrage that took place in Ethereum was about $6 million uh, cumulatively through the middle of 2019. But DEX volume is only 0.1% of the total trading volume in cryptocurrency ecosystems. Centralized exchanges account for the vast majority of the trades. You know, an iceberg sits 10% above the waterline, so I literally mean tip of the tip of the tip of the iceberg. Centralized exchanges account for about $50 billion a day in volume. And the trades that take place in these exchanges are hidden. There's no trace of them on chain. They're regulated in a patchwork way, rather inconsistently, sometimes playing jurisdictional arbitrage, if you will. And they're known to lose money. I mean, oh, it seems that every other month there's a report in the popular press of some exchange getting hacked and they will front run their users and get, engage in other shenanigans. We don't really know what's happening here because all of this is happening in the shadows, right? under the waterline, if you will. So we don't really know what sort of malfeasance is happening in centralized exchanges. If what we've seen in decentralized exchanges is any indication, it's probably not good. That's most of what I have to say about decentralized exchanges and arbitrage, but I want to add some bonus slides here. There's another story that arose in the course of our investigation of priority gas auctions. One observation that surfaced is that there is a, the risk, and it's a substantial risk, of a new type of attack arising in Ethereum and similar cryptocurrencies or blockchains. This attack we refer to as a time banded attack. And here's the idea. A miner mounts a time banded attack by observing recent arbitrage opportunities, perhaps taken by bots. These are opportunities that have already been recorded on chain. These are trades that have already been made against the smart contract that administers the decentralized exchanges trades. So some miner observes that there were these recent juicy transactions. What does the miner do? The miner rewinds the blockchain and then forks it in a 51% attack. Now, 51% attacks are not new, and they've been observed in the real world. Ethereum Classic was subjected to one fairly recently. What's new here is that the miner has observed these arbitrage opportunities taken by bots, and because it's acting as a miner when it forks the chain, it gets to dictate what transactions are placed in the blocks it produces. So it can take, retroactively, can take the opportunities that were taken by the bots on the main chain. It can take those itself 
in this forked chain. It can steal the arbitrage opportunities from the miners, as it were, and use the money, the profit it obtains by taking these arbitrage opportunities to subsidize the attack. 51% attacks are usually performed just to harvest the block rewards. But in this case, you can harvest much more. You know, there's value in the application layer, not just in the consensus layer. And a miner can take advantage of this to mount exactly the attack I described. This sort of attack, of course, destabilizes the whole blockchain and potentially puts a system like Ethereum at risk. This type of attack is not just hypothetical. Not hypothetical in the sense that there are very large opportunities, arbitrage opportunities, present in Ethereum today, and particularly during periods of high volume trading. For example, in July of 2018, there was about $1.5 billion in DEX volume. To mount a one month 51% attack, according to crypto51.app, at any rate, interesting website for those of you who are not familiar with it, Amount of 51% attack for a month would have cost 56 million. This is just 4% of the DEX volume at that time. We don't know the full breadth of the arbitrage opportunities during that month, but 4% is a fairly small fraction, and it seems likely that there, was, there were sufficient arbitrage opportunities for somebody to, mounted a, to have mounted a time banded attack. We've observed very large individual opportunities during that period of time, some of them approaching 100 ether, about $20,000 in today's value. Okay. And another thing that a time bandit can do is rewind the blockchain and execute trades with knowledge of future prices. So imagine that today somebody whispered into your ear authoritatively the price of IBM stock a year from now. You would become a rich woman or man. You could trade on this future knowledge. Well, that's exactly what a time bandit attacker can do by rewinding the blockchain. Uh, the time bandit can observe the current price of some asset, rewind the blockchain, execute DEX trades with knowledge of this future price, and presumably make a fortune. There's a lot more in the paper. I've only touched on the very surface of this research. We provide the mathematical model I described in depth. We provide a model for priority gas auctions that may be of interest to game theoreticians given the peculiar characteristics of these auctions. We report on a lot more data than I've had a chance to review in this presentation, of course. We talk about how we ourselves unintentionally created the bot community. As it turns out, we posted a blog warning people of the risk of this type of arbitrage happening. This is a graph of arbitrage opportunities over time, and that red line indicates the point at which we published our blog post. So sadly, the warning we meant to issue to the community became a self-fulfilling uh, prophecy, and we learned a lesson about interventionist science. Uh, we also uh, accidentally made the bot community more efficient by creating a token known as gas token, which effectively lowers the price that you need to pay for gas. It's very popular with arbitrage bots, as it turns out. This was very impactful research. So there, there are some lessons to be learned from these two incidents. If you want to learn more, I encourage you to have a look at the paper. I should mention that Phil Diane, the lead author, uh, my PhD student did the lion's share of the work and really deserves credit for all of these observations. And finally, let me point out that this is just one of many projects taking place under the banner of the Initiative for Cryptocurrencies and Contracts, or IC3, of which I'm a co-director, and Andrew Miller, another co-director of IC3, is present here today. Thank you. Uh, great talk, thanks. Uh, I'm just wondering why the time bandit uh, attacks that you've uh, described at the end, uh, why aren't they subject to the normal, you know, essentially this is a payment system, payments go up, then supply will go up. So as soon as, you know, there's opportunity to make more money out of fees and rewards go up, 
uh, why isn't, doesn't it become much, much harder to mount a 51% attack because, you know, immediately more miners will start mining? Yeah, so I'm not... Maybe the answer is the system is not fast enough to uh, respond with increased supply. You know, these bots are generating increased demand. Right. Yes, so there certainly is increased mining activity during these periods of heavy trading, but there are also many more arbitrage opportunities. Right? And the value that an attacker can harvest from the blockchain consequently rises, and rises considerably. So, so the, the usual security analysis that shows, you know, a 51% attack would not pay off, and that... Yeah, but that, that's because... Is, yeah, so that's true, but most 51% analyses assume that the attacker is only able to profit to the extent of the block reward. In this case, the attacker is harvesting value from the application layer. But let me put it another way. Most models of, or most analyses of consensus level security look only at the consensus layer. They also look at fees in, and even dynamic fees, but... Yeah, okay, yes, so fees do get analyzed to a certain extent, but essentially the consensus layer, uh, security of the consensus layer is analyzed in isolation. The observation here is that the application layer, the transactions taking place at the application layer, can actually impact consensus layer security in a profound way. And the rewards to be reaped from arbitrage are considerably larger in many cases than the block reward itself. So the application layer becomes a destabilizing influence in the security of the consensus layer. That, that's really the essence of the observation here. Thank you. Sorry, we're running out of time, so we'll take the other questions. Okay, thank, thank you. you.